Hello, everyone, and welcome. <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous today because I feel like I'm walking on, walking on thin ice this, this episode, this time. I had this kind of great idea about, you know, how to, how to, how to build up this story, but uh, I'm not sure. Let's see how it goes. Anyway, we're going to talk about creativity. The nuts and bolts approach. The nuts and bolts approach to creativity. Um, hey, Pooh Ninja, hello. Damien, hey. Hello, everyone. Mibu, hi. <laughs> nice to see familiar faces. <clears throat> so anyways, um, yeah. A French author, Emmanuel Bigelli. Uh, he's in the middle of making a book about handmade guitars. <laughs> Hello, Johnny. And uh, um, Emmanuel wanted to feature uh, our work uh, in his book, and which is great. Much appreciated. Um, thank you, Emmanuel. So um, he sent me a questionnaire um, asking this and that. You know, how did I get started as a luthier? Uh, who have been my influences and so on. And the last question was about innovation. Emmanuel wrote, What remains to be invented today? Has it all been done? This is Emmanuel's words that I received in his questionnaire a couple of weeks ago. What a question. And I spent, you know, the best part of yesterday uh, trying to come up with a somewhat conclusive, civilized answer to Emmanuel's last question, whether there remains something to be invented today. and Has it all been done? You know, and the ideas kept dwelling and changing shape in my mind until I figured I need to talk about this stuff today in, the live, in this live stream. Hey, Vincent, Alex, great that you're back. Um, yeah, so let's talk about creativity. What is it? Where does it come from? Is it different today than it used to be? Um, first, I'll tell you a story. And before I tell you a story, a little disclaimer. Disclaimer. Um, it is a story about one guitar I made, but there's a moral to it, to the story, and it kind of has nothing to do with that actual guitar, but more about the flow of the process, how that instrument came to be. And that has everything to do with the topic today. Um, yeah. So 12 years ago, I was driving a car with a friend of mine. We had a long drive ahead, And it was about a two-hour drive. We thought it would be a two-hour drive. Uh, we started talking about the future of electric guitar. And then the, our chatter shifted into the history of electric guitar and how it all had gotten started back in the day. And uh, at some point, he asked me, you know, what if the electric guitar would have been invented earlier on, like, for example, in the end of 19th century? And we started brainstorming. I don't know, I, I wouldn't call it at that moment brainstorming. It was more like we were laughing, coming up with funny ideas. Like, you know, like you're sitting down with a friend, having fun, and the ideas just flow. Like they come and go, and you're having the time of your lives. Um this effortless flow of thoughts happening in that very, very moment. And, you know, 
as we were laughing and coming up with these ideas, it led into even crazier ideas that made us laugh even some more. And it was happening there with no intentions whatsoever. So it was like purely, um, I think the best possible comparison to this feeling is that it was like child's play what we were doing there. We, it was like child's play. Like a, chi a child is in the moment playing, doing doing the fun stuff. You know, remember that feeling climbing in trees or hide and seek or swimming with, with friends or whatever it is that you enjoyed to do as a child. Remember that feeling. It's like it's pure and it happens right there, right then, and there's nothing else in the world. I think our car trip with my friend was kind of like that. And to prove the point that, you know, when you get to that flow state of mind, time literally ceases to exist. For us it did, then, because we thought we would drive for two hours from A to B, but because we dived so deep into our conversation about, you know, brainstorming this um, guitar, how the electric guitar could have been if it would have been invented the late 19th century, end of 19th century. So that we kind of missed a turn when I was driving and we ended up totally somewhere where we shouldn't have been. You know, we, we drove another hour until we noticed that, you know, where the hell are we? <laughs> we were on our way to a meeting, so we called the guy we were supposed to meet that uh, looks like we're a bit late so we took a wrong turn we didn't notice we're chatting so turn the car we continue the talk and so on and so on and we miss another turn and we find ourselves totally somewhere where we shouldn't have been again in, an, in another hour where this kind of where it kind of became surreal in a way because hey two hours from place a to place b but we're like by the time now we're two hours late and we have another hour to go so our two hour trip turned to five hour trip but those five hours disappeared because of the flow of the moment and um, by the end of our drive, we had come up with a fictional idea of the first electric guitar in the world, invented in 1896 by this imaginary guitar maker. And the guitar itself was aesthetically influenced by classical guitar, violin, and in some regard, Victorian era architecture and ornamentation. But that at the heart of it all was a fictional invention. So it was like writing a script. That's what we were doing. So it was an in, in, a fictional invention uh, done by our imaginary guitar maker, which was an active pickup powered by vacuum tubes. And <laughs> we were both... Uh, we were both over the moon about this this game, this this play, this journey to to such an you know such a fascinating alternative past. And my friend said to me at the end of the trip, "Make me that guitar for real. Make me that guitar for real." <laughs> Hey, you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
This is the guy, Junnu, this is the guy I was in the car. He's the guy I was driving with. <laughs> I'm very, very happy that you're here. Um, so, um, hello, more people. Ender 2011, Elftorp. That could be my son. Is that my son? Is it Elias there? Hey, Elias. Cool. <laughs> Welcome, people. More people come, keep showing up. Say hello, everyone who's out there. Um, yeah, so that's what Yunu told me. Make me that guitar for real. And this became my pet project, uh, a concept guitar that I worked on whenever I had the time for the next five years. I had no specific goals other than well, obviously making this guitar for, for, for my friend, but, um, uh, you know, uh, then, then to continue the role play, for me it was like, that was the idea. I would continue that role play we had started. I was that imaginary, <laughs> imaginary guitar maker, fictional guitar maker, making that that guitar that we had come up with the script. So it was kind of like I was playing out this movie in my mind. You know, and um, I can't say that I would have expected too much from that pickup either, but I did want to make it somewhat functional because this guitar was kind of turning out to be sort of like a steampunk thing. It was named Captain Nemo uh, later down the road. And and it had this kind of steampunk vibe to it, but but one one thing I mean I kind of dig the the steampunk stuff, but but there is a certain aspect I I I can't stand. I mean it's kind of I, I hate it that it's it's so gimmicky when when things are made to look like certain way, but they don't really work. There's lots of these you know nuts and bolts and 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 stuff and chains, but they don't work. It just looks like something, but it doesn't work for real. But you know. The, the type of st uh, steampunk items and stuff that that really works, um, uh, I, I I kind of I, I really love that when people have you know been through the effort of of making that stuff work. Hey Puninja, throw some thumbs, folks. Thanks for reminding. <laughs> Hit the like button if, but only if you like the video. Otherwise, do not. <laughs> um. Uh, yeah, so anyway, I wanted to make that pickup functional, and I needed help with it. Um, and about five years later, in 2014, I got that instrument ready. And to my pleasant surprise, really to my pleasant surprise, genuine pleasant surprise, it sounded great. Because I, I had no idea. I mean, this was just, it was... A crazy concept guitar. Um, you know, the, the, the tone of this guitar was different from anything I had heard before. Okay, admittedly, you know, the guitar, the, it was a beast out of control <laughs> in some regard. Because the pickup was too powerful. You know, you cranked it up from the guitar volume and you could break an amplifier. I mean, it was, it was out of control. And, you know, the, the power supply thingy hooked to it was this big wooden box that was awkwardly clumsy and, and all that, but, uh, yeah, and, and, the uh, and the controls of, it was very kind of unlike a guitar, very, very difficult to adapt for a guitarist. So, so it wasn't it wasn't right there, but that unique tonal element just kept haunting me. You know, it kept haunting my thoughts that there is something so different in this. That what if we could develop this into something serious? And this persistent thought sparked off another very different type of research and development project. You know, we, be, we began the journey 
of transforming that crazy two pickup innovation into a professional piece of guitar gear that we hoped would offer a genuinely new sound. I'm going to repeat that. New sound because the rarest thing on earth in two, in the year 2020 or in, in 2000s even. You know, everything is about retro and f recreating the old sounds, but where are the new sounds? So we wanted to offer a genuinely new sound to the field of electric guitar. And it's the beginning. What started as a pure child's play, remember that feeling of child's play, it's effortless, without any ulterior motives, uh, evolved eventually into something innovative and useful. And the moral of the story is that letting go of certainties, you know, playing, there's no certainties, there's just that moment. You know, allowing yourself to be a child again, to play like a child, to go a bit crazy in the flow of having fun, that is the pathway to possibly finding something novel, something new, something that didn't exist yet. It doesn't happen every time, but there is that possibility every time. <laughs> you just can't know it until after the leap. And that's the, I think that's the beauty of it. It's also probably why, you know, it happens kind of so rarely because, because we're grown-ups. We're so serious. You know, we're, we're, we're grown-ups. We can't play. We can't have fun. We can't just let go of the guidelines, the rules, the routines that have become like over the years, over the decades that tie us down. So, yeah, there is that possibility, but you can't know it until after the leap. <laughs> and that's the moral of the story. Um, but, as we know, the world is absolutely saturated with great ideas that never see the, the the light of day you know ideas the child's play part of it that's that is literally that is the effortless part of innovation it's the part when you're just having fun in this flow state of mind and ideas come ideas go in other words opportunities reveal themselves to you they keep, you know, popping up from left and right. And all you need to do is to recognize when something meaningful is about to pass by and grasp it, you know. Grasp it before it's gone. Yeah, and then when you have that idea, You know, that's when the grunt work, the real work begins. And that's when the ideas get weighed for real. It's the blood, sweat, and tears part. And, and that's also why all the wonderful ideas that have never been realized made true. Because an idea isn't anything. I mean, it is a thought. It comes and it goes. You know, if you grasp it and you start working on it, it can become something, but otherwise, an idea is nothing. You know, you let go of it, it's gone. Um, yeah, the groundwork. My friend Max Lazinger, I don't know if Max is here. Say hello, Max, if you're there listening, watching. He commented my last newsletter. 
uh, a note I sent a, about this live stream was it yesterday or this morning I can't remember you maybe you guys receive it if you haven't subscribed as I to my newsletter go do it from my website anyways um, then you'll the first to know of all the exciting stuff <laughs> um, yeah Max Lazinger wrote the famous quote that I grasped <laughs> from that note he sent me uh, and I'm repeating it here when Thomas Edison ha was asked how he discovered the one filament that finally worked in the first light bulb Edison replied I discovered 10,000 ways that didn't work <laughs> and yeah I can relate to that you know it's like the last 10 12 <laughs> years of my life and not only my life but the team that was working on our two pickup the valve bucker you know the 10 I, I I say it again the 10 years of hard work that followed the cool idea to make an active electric guitar pickup powered by vacuum tubes so the idea was like hey five hours and we were brainstorming and it was somewhere there on a kind of a sideline of our script was this pickup that would be part of part of this uh, imaginary guitar that followed 12 yeah 12 years of work until we got that thing ready um, I'm gonna bring Poo Ninja's comment to the screen because it's pretty good Ninja says the unknown should be ex exhilarating, not frightening. Change is the only true constant. Amen. Yeah, I can I can put my name under that. Yeah, sign my name under that. Um, so how does this relate to making music? You know, writing a hit song, forming a band that would make it big. You know, write to the chat. Or afterwards, if you're not watching this live, you're watching the this the, the recording, please leave your comment. You know. Um, how do you compose? Where do your ideas come from? Because you know, I could imagine that both of these facets of creativity that we now described, the, the child's play and the grunt work, you know, they have a both they have a role to play uh, in making music just as they do in my work. You know. Grunt work is kind of, it, it's easy to understand. It's just work. It's just a lot of work. You just need to put the hours. If you don't put the hours, you don't get there. But the child's play part is the, you know, you know, it's the, it, it, it's it's more like a, excuse my, my phrasing, but it's like a, the, the mind fuck, you know. It's kind of like that you, you just, because we're adults, we're so, like I said, like we're so important, we're so serious. We're even when even when we're mindful, we're serious, you know. <laughs> even though mindfulness is supposed to be in the moment, but for us, it, often mindfulness is something that you're like, you're like somewhere, ooh. and <laughs> whereas mindfulness can, you know. Watching my my child Elias play out in the garden, or or play um, what is what is the game he plays? Minecraft on 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 his PlayStation Four. You know, he's being mindful. He's being he's inventing all the time. So it's or especially when he's drawing. My child has, my son Elias has this thing, which I I adore, and I I have to tell you this little story also, um, that you know we in my family we listen to music a lot, and for whatever reason I mean it, we're kind of uh, kind of adamant with the that that we typically we wouldn't stream music we wouldn't put it in the background, it's more like we have a stereo system with a nice tube amplifier and the and the turntable so we would put on a vinyl recording 
play. And this is okay. My son is now nine years old, and since he was maybe six or even younger, maybe five, he has known how to safely put on the vinyl on the turntable, put the needle, you know, the stillers, sorry, the stillers, the card rate, whatever it is, the arm, <laughs> you know, put it there, bring it down, and listen to a record. Because her mom and I have, have taught, taught him how to do that. He likes to listen to music. It's it's what we do in the in the evenings often. So, what happens typically? So we put on a record. Let's say one of Elias's favorite records could be Genesis "Selling England" by the Pound. <laughs> Believe it or not, nine years old. That's what he goes there to the, you know, record shelf and pulls out, quite often, or Nursery Crime, or Foxtrot, but pretty often it's "Selling England" by the Pound, and. He puts it on, he sits down at our living room table, he has a piece of paper, and the moment the music starts, he starts drawing. And he draws and draws and draws until the side A comes to an end. And when the stillus raises, his pencil stops. And he either walks to the turntable to turn the album or asks me, or his mom to turn the album, turn the turn the uh, record, so he can continue drawing. <sighs> and those drawings are amazing. Remind me next time I'm going to show you some drawings, or one of these times I'm going to show you some drawings that he has been doing, if he gives his permission. <laughs> Otherwise, not. Anyway, I'm going to take this comment down. Yeah, okay, so, yeah, let's change perspective. Sometimes I hear people talk that, you know, when you study in, in a music academy or conservatory, you become somehow, well, like a, a school guitarist meaning somehow something of a lesser <laughs> lesser of a guitarist than the guy who hasn't studied you know like this you know like the studied professional would be somehow less cool than the rock and roll guy who didn't study have you come across with that so i've come across with that phenomenon, that thought, quite a few times over the years. And I'm thinking, can studying suppress creativity? What do you think? Because when I'm looking at it from the guitar maker's perspective again, I would say that, you know, it, it can happen. Of course, not always. It, it can happen, but looking at this question in, in a, a bit bigger perspective, I'd say that it's, it's not about the studying, per se. You know, it's more about the familiarization. You know what I mean? That can cause suppression or routinizing you know it's challenging to remain fresh curious open-minded over a long period of time when working intensively on any specific field or being guided being taught working under guidance of someone with a vision you know so I think one term, there is like a term called over-specializing that describes this in some way. But again, the, the key 
to overcome this challenge, this obstacle on the way of, you know, making fresh, memorable new music or coming up with new ideas, coming up with new stuff. Um, it's again like the full circle to the child's play. That's the key. To keep your antennas up, to remain curious, to remain fresh. Yeah. What is Vincent saying? Vincent says, I feel sitting around a fireplace right now listening. <laughs> that was a while ago, though, you wrote that. Mibu. But we shoot, man. Like Jesus said, be like children. A wise man. Um, Vincent is saying also something else. Today, one must place the time in the agenda. To do that, one has to master his time. The child is free of time. Thus, he play and reach the, reach the source. Reach the source. Reach the source. It's not easy. For an adult. Yeah. And Vincent continues, I think too much focus, specialization can be harmful to completeness. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are risks. And it's good to be aware of it. Because specializing, we get to the next... Actually, this is a, the, a great bridge to the next change of perspective for us. Because... Um, specialization... Okay, yeah, let's, let's go to the next topic. The third facet of what creativity is. And how innovation or inventiveness, or creativity, how, how, it, how can it be allowed to grow? How can that, because it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's a skill. It's like a, it's, like a, it's like a muscle. When you train a muscle, the muscle learns to do it better. You know, you train your muscles. Okay, we're talking about the ordinary muscles. It's kind of easy to get it. You know, the, the more you do your push-ups or, or whatever you do, the nicer <laughs> muscles you have. <laughs> right. And, and you can train your brain the same way. The train is in a way a muscle too. So is there a way to kind of, you know, allow this feature, this this skill of creativity to allow it to grow into measure that can be right now unforeseeable, but later on in life it might might you know actualize when you just keep on practicing. I think I'm gonna say goodnight to my son. Excuse me for a minute. Have fun. My son is too shy to come to the screen, but he has been listening and he wanted to say hi and he wanted to show one of his drawings that um, he has drawn to her mother, Emma, 
while he was listening to music. I don't know what music he was listening to when he, but let's, I'm going to show this to the camera. I hope it, I hope you can see what's in. I bet it must have been prog rock. <laughs> what he's been listening to come up with this. These are awesome, and you can't see the detail, but they are so detailed. It's amazing. There's tiny details that... It's filled with tiny details. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, okay, let's go back to the topic. So how to let your skill to create grow well i'm talking about mastering your art or your craft what is mastery what is mastering your art what does it mean let's talk about that in a while um because it's kind of related to what someone was saying, Vincent was saying here about too much focus, too much specialization can be harmful. Yes, there, is, there are risks when things get too narrow. If you get these kind of shades and you kind of can't see the whole picture. <sighs> Glad you like the, the artwork, the drawing. It's amazing. I hope I can show some more later. Um, mastering the, your art. Okay, I'm going to talk about my brother a little bit. I haven't asked his permission, and I know that he's not listening to this, so I'm, I'm hoping that he's okay with this. I'm going to deal with it later because I need to tell this, this other story because it's, I think it's good. Um, you know, when we were kids, I'm, not, I'm 48 years old, by the way. My brother is one year younger, so he's Yanni, my brother. He's 47. Um, when we were kids, we played soccer a lot. We played in the same team. We were just kids. And I abandoned the ball games and got a guitar <laughs> instead quite early on. But my brother continued. And at the peak of his soccer days, he played in the in the A junior national team of our country. And uh, this was in uh, in the end of eighties, I think. Yeah, in the end of eighties, right there in the early nineties. Um, uh, and the newspapers wrote about him being the next superstar soccer player from Finland. Okay, he was a teenager at this point, 15, 16. Um, and then things faded out, kind of. Within within some years, things faded out. He didn't become the super superstar. And we were recently discussing this with my brother because there is this documentary out in 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 Ule. Okay, those of you from Finland, you can check it out from Ule Arena. Something about old photograph in Finnish Vanha Valokuva, something like that. I can't remember the title of the the. It tells about this team where my brother also played and the, the national team. And, uh, yeah, we were discussing this with him, you know, the past years. He told me that in hindsight, when he looks into those past years playing soccer, as when he looks at that as objectively as he can, he can confidently, ob objectively say that he had the talent to go anywhere and when he was a kid he practiced all the time except for him he was not really practicing he was just playing he was having fun it was his life to keep the ball in the air you know wherever he was it was ongoing even when alone in his room he found a way to play soccer in one way or the other, you know, I had my room next to his, and I I heard it, 
you know. And I could see it from the walls. <laughs> he didn't have any furniture in the room. <laughs> he had his bed there, nothing else. So he could fit better with the soccer ball. Um, you know, and then some. at some point later on, my brother told me it became more like a responsibility with all kinds of expectations coming from the outside. And the child's play stopped. He didn't do it anymore unless he had to. You know, the, the, he went to the practices. He was very diligent in, in practicing with the team. But, but that, you know, all that time he used to play. He didn't do it anymore. Um, so he told me that his talent took him to a point, to the national team with the age juniors, 15-year-old. But at the end of the day, you know, it's a matter of practicing hard, eating hard, sleeping right, sacrificing yourself, sacrificing your life, your time to that altar of playing soccer. And he just didn't do that, like play that spark. It wasn't there anymore. So, my brother, my dear brother, continued to another direction, lives a happy life, no regrets, and <laughs> when he stepped down from the age junior national team, he did give an opportunity to another young kid who inherited his position as center back in the team. And that kid's name was Sami Hyypiä. Those who know something about soccer might <laughs> might recognize the name. True story. Um, yeah. So what is mastering your art? You mastering your craft. You know, you give you give it your everything. Right. It becomes your life. It becomes your lifestyle. It becomes your you live, you sleep, you breathe. That. And then comes the challenges of over-specializing and routinizing and, you know, familiarizing and all that stuff. All those obstacles that can stop you. But <laughs> there are ways to steer clear of that. And <laughs> one of the best ones I know is to not take it too seriously. To remind yourself, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not a heart surgeon. <laughs> I'm not say, I'm not saving lives. It's not that kind of work. It doesn't need to be taken so seriously. When the fun is there, it keeps it fresh. And there's a chance from time to time to grasp something new. Yeah. I don't get much questions from you guys. You're just listening. Or are you even there? Hello? Maybe. <laughs> you don't, no, no need for questions right now. You can leave your questions afterwards, the reco recording. I would love to hear questions or comments. Um, but I'd, I'd like to just bring bring in one more one more thing, one more facet, one more question for you, because I don't necessarily have an answer to this. But I, I'm gonna just throw it out. You know, that has something changed? Because I'm also hearing that it used to be earlier, you know, easier earlier on to come up with new stuff. Get your songs heard, make it in music business. Now it's all, you know, screwed up. You know, has the has the has the process of creativity changed? Or or is it like simply so that everything <laughs> worth inventing has been already already done? Because I think the fundamentals are the same. 
you know, creating new music, meaningful music or product or whatever, it's always been hard. It's always been hard. It appears to be easy when you look at it from the outside, but it's never been easy. Back in the day, it was different kind of hard because there were no examples. There was no light bulb <laughs> that Thomas Edison could take and observe and improve, you know. <laughs> he had to pull it out of his hat from scratch, literally from scratch, with the filaments, 10,000, whatever there was. I heard it was 6,000, but I kind of tend to believe it must have been 10,000 at least. <laughs> so nowadays it's the paradox of choice you know it's things of course the world has changed the world has changed back in the day okay there were no examples so you had to <laughs> really be a special person to kind of figure out those things how can someone come up with a light bulb out of what? Out of, like, well, harnessing the lightning. Right. Like in the movie, Back, it, Back to the Future. Remember? Um, the paradox of choice. There's so... So, you know, now the big challenge is to get heard from all the noise. And and sure, yeah, all the music business has changed for sure. And, and, and <laughs> that's a topic for another, what, five live streams I think and we're definitely going to get back to that and I have at least one or two guests that I'm discussing with you know to talk about music business to talk about how the world has changed how things used to be how things are now where might we be going so we're going to talk about that in the coming coming episodes of these live streams not maybe next week, but it's coming. There's actually, Vincent, The Paradox of Choice. There's a book called Paradox of Choice. Read the book. It's a good book. Um, as a warm-up, the hardcore fans out there, you could watch this if you want. I'm going to put this um, link to the chat. There you go. There's a YouTube link to one a video from... I don't know if that link works, actually. Maybe it works. I hope it works. Maybe you need to copy-paste it. I don't know. Um, this is a video that I made a couple of years ago. I think I titled it The Electric Guitar Dead? Question mark. I talk about the past, the current situation, the future scenarios, <laughs> looking deep into my crystal ball. So you can watch that and and we can talk about it later. Leave your comment. If you watch that old video, leave your comment to that. And more questions, more questions. But next week, um, Yeah, I have received a ton of questions about guitar making. And now I had kind of decided to not go there because the reason for me to do these streams, um, it was not to teach people how to make guitars. It was not even to sell you guitars. Um but it was to offer my view to solve problems that guitarists may have with their instruments, you know, to help you guys in any way I can to learn how to know your instrument better. So, so you can play better if you know your instrument better. Maybe you can get that little extra notch to your playing. And when you play better, you might succeed better in what you do. So I'm I'm here trying to help you be more successful in whatever you do with guitar. <laughs> so
that's the purpose of this live stream. Um, but, you know, next episode, I'm going to do an exception. But before that, before I tell what is the exception, I'm going to read what Puninja is saying. I'm bringing it in here. Puninja, translating feelings to words or music or art is always changing. I don't foresee the well of wonderment drying up even when the robots take over. Great. I like that thinking. I'm a, I'm a romantic and I'm a... Some things I, I, I tend to be a little bit of a skepticist and a cynical person the older I get, but... I'm trying to hold on to that hope. Um, yeah, so I'm going to make it do an exception to my rule. And I'm going to dedicate the next live stream for luthiers and hobby builders. So <laughs> you luthier tribe people, please spread the word. You know, once in a lifetime opportunity ahead. We're going to talk about making guitars and whatever questions you've already sent me about uh, technical aspects. At least I can remember, you know, out of my hat, one question that has repeated like a hundred times is that, you know, how do you make your living as a luthier? How, how, how to get going with it? So we're going to talk about all that stuff, maybe some technical stuff. Um, so, you know, if you have questions, <coughs> keep them coming. You can leave them. If you have questions, um, leave them to the to the comments of this video, and we will collect them from there. And next week, or better yet, be there next week Wednesday for the weekly Wednesday live stream Q and A, and uh, we'll talk about that stuff. Um, and I would encourage all players, of course, to join the stream next week because who knows, you know. <clears throat> I might have some fun stories to tell or whatever. And in any case, a change of perspective sometimes brings surprising results. And around the corners you find unexpected things. You might grasp an idea that you wouldn't have found otherwise. Um, so yeah, please like the video, but only if you like it. Share to your friends, su subscribe to this channel if you already haven't. And believe it or not, I am in time. The magical one hour limit. I'm under five minutes, so I think I'm gonna actually end here because it feels pretty nice. I think we had a good good talk. I hope I feel good about this talk. I hope you guys feel good about this talk. Send your comments now to the chat or afterwards to the to the comment field. So have a great week and um, we will see you next time. I hope so. What is, sorry, I'm supposed to go. I'm not going. Kuusi volttia, six volttia, kuusi volttia productions. Knowledge is poison to creativity. When you don't know enough, you try and create. Knowledge puts you, puts you into safe mode. Yeah, that's one way to put it. But if you end there, There's so much growth that you can't reach, I feel. Knowledge is painful. Yes, knowledge is painful because the more you know, is how little you know and how much more there is to know. And I think this is, this is what, what drives me in what I do. You know, I feel that I have achieved and mastered um, quite a few things when it comes to guitar making. But the more years I have under my belt doing this, the better I've, the more humble I'm becoming to understand that, hey, 
nothing is carved in stone. Nothing is given. It's like you know, every evening you go to sleep. Next morning you notice and a new day, um, symbolically speaking, a new life begins. And knowledge can be poison to creativity, but it necessarily is not. There are great, great, great examples of that around the world. A lot of people, a lot of people we see around us, a lot of wise.